let's begin. And uh, first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for agreeing to take part in this roundtable post-streaming discussion. My guests today are Melissa Ono-George, who is the Associate Professor and Director of Student Experience at Royal University. We've got Lynette Goddard, Professor of Black Theatre and Performance at Royal Holloway. Tyrone Huggins, who is an actor and a writer, who has performed in more than 90 shows over his illustrious career and written 17 performance pieces for a range of the major companies in the UK. And certainly by no means last or least, she is last but not least, um, we have Donna Kroll joining us, who is one of our leading actors of Caribbean dis descent here in the UK, whose career spans over 40 years and has appeared in some major productions for some major companies. So thank you very much, all of you, uh, for taking part in this discussion. And I want to start um, straight away by putting this discussion into uh, context, because I think uh, it, the, the discussion is, is prompted by the streaming of Andrew Lever's Small Island. Um, but we are living through a moment where there are people on the streets of Britain protesting against systemic racism and calling for justice and equal access to power. So some might say that this is indeed a timely streaming of Andrea's play. And Lynette Goddard, I'd like to uh, turn to you first of all. What, what do you think? Do you think this is a timely moment for this play? I do. I mean, first of all, I love Small Island. I love the book. Um, and seeing the play kind of brought back the memories of reading that book, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. I think it is a timely play. I think, you know, one of the things that it deals with is immigration. And one of the things that Britain is still trying to understand, I think, is its in the history of immigration. And I think it's quite interesting for the kind of younger generation who maybe don't know about that history, why people made the decision to come over to uh, the UK when they did in the post-war period, and then the impact that that kind of continued to have in terms of multiracialism today, multiracialism today. Um, so I think it's kind of timely in that respect. I think we should see it as a historical play. And I think right now there's been lots of debates, doesn't there, around um, history and legacy, and uh, you know, the whole thing with the, should we, should statues of people who have connections to slavery be left out or removed? And um, that's a really, really important debate. And I think that this play is a historical play and we should take it as a historical play that taps into um, kind of legacies of colonialism and the ways that those legacies then moved into the kind of post-war period and the decisions that happened there. Um, so I think it is a timely play because I think it's one that educates us about that and helps us to kind of um, understand what was happening then and then the way that like, the, the legacies of that continued to impact on our lives today. Great, thank you. And uh, Melissa, as you know, as a historian, um, I was really keen that you could take part in this discussion to throw uh, more light on what Lynette has just said about, I mean, it's really interesting describing the play as a history play, but can you, um, can you perhaps uh, give us some context in terms of Britain's relationship uh, with the Caribbean over the past 300 years or so? Um, yeah, I can try. So, I mean, the legacy, I, I like that sort of the legacies of colonialism, right? So the legacies of colonialism is anti-blackness. <laughs> like that is what we're seeing. That's what these protests are about. Um, it is a relationship the relationship that Britain has had in Europe more broadly has had with the Caribbean over the past 200 or 300 years has been one of exploitation really and 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 power and dom um, and uh, dominance and, and dependency and so I think that um, what we're seeing now is all of that just I mean, it's just reoccurring. This is not the first time, right? Like we see these eruptions right? <laughs> again and again because there's yeah. this long-standing history of, um, of une an unequal history between these two regions in the world and the people in, in uh, those regions. But um, in terms of like the legacies of colonialism and the anti-blackness, 
I mean, that's not changed for two, two, three hundred years. So slavery, right? People think that slavery is abolished and then that's it. But of course, the ideologies that sort of um, allowed slavery to, to continue to happen, continue. We've not really gotten away from, from that. So the thinking about people of African ancestry, right, as, as black people and what yeah. that means, that's not changed at all. And so and that continues, you see it in the, in the press and the media and the things that people are you know, still thinking and saying. I'm sure all of us have probably have, have had these experiences, right? Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you know, and so, yeah, so it's not, yeah. 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 And, is, yeah, and could you just map out a little bit more in terms of, because obviously in terms of Small Island and the play, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, not wishing to uh, make any assumptions about Andrea Levy and, and, you know, certainly I imagine she wrote the book because it, from her experience or the experience of her parents, mm. et cetera. Um, but it, I just wanted to say, think more about, so that's a, an important moment in history for her, but how many more important moments, you know, how many of these epochs have that in that relationship between say Britain and the Caribbean, but also Britain and Africa and the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's a, I would say that the relationship between uh, Britain um, and uh, parts of Africa and the Caribbean is, is one that's it's quite entangled, right? And has been entangled um, for hundreds of years and entangled in terms of um, economics, but also in terms of like the way we, um, uh, ideology and thinking of each other and even some ideas that we have, um, that we hold as sort of universal, as universal or developed during these initial phases and interactions with the Caribbean. So ideas around like freedom, for instance, right? And, and all of these things, of course, are developed in relationship, um, uh, Britain's relationship to slavery and slaveholding, right? Mm -hmm. um, ideas about whiteness even, right? or blackness around race are developed during this period of slavery and, and in this enlightenment period, so the 18th and 19th century, um, you know, who, who belongs and who doesn't, but all of these different, ways of thinking developed during these er earlier period, during this earlier period. And yeah. so Britain, um, and so this relationship is a very entangled relationship. Hmm. Now, in terms of these different ep uh, sort of epochs, I suppose, or these different, um, besides slavery, after slavery, let's say, right? Because yeah. we understand that slavery itself, that's a massive thing. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> about, you know, um, there's, you know, there's years and years of debates and discussions about, uh, you know, the Caribbean and um, and Britishness and Britain and, and so on uh, during the during the slavery period. But even after the slavery period, the one big one immediately after the slavery period that comes to mind is the Mont Bay Rebellion in 1865, um, where um, uh, uh, Governor Eyre, who's British governor at the time, um, unleashes incredible um, brutality to suppress a rebellion in Morant Bay in Jamaica and is as a result you know hundreds of people hundreds of homes are damaged hundreds of people are um, are uh, brutalized and killed um, and Eyre, Governor Eyre is actually put on trial for murder <laughs> right and so there's this relief there's this discussion during this period of, <laughs> yes he, he does he's put, he's put on trial <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, that's you. I was getting to that. <laughs> right? But there's this discussion during this period. There is this discussion during this period, and even beforehand, about um, the, the place of sort of black black Britons in the British Empire. Right? What place do black people, black Caribbeans, have in the British? If they're not being treated, if we're not treating them equally. Then what place do they have? And um, and yeah, as Donna said, he gets off because it's very clear. <laughs> <laughs> the Caribbean has, but I mean, there's other epochs as well. So, like the second with the First World War, you know, when um, yeah. Britain does a call out for people, uh, men to to um, to fight, and of course the Caribbean answers. And yeah. you know, there's um, thinking that that sort of contribution, this additional contribution, will ha somehow change that relationship of exploitation and and um, will make things better somehow and of course it, it, things don't change and there's discontent right again and this yeah. is the beginning of this decolonization the period of decolonization um that you know 
in which the Caribbean eventually becomes decolonized in the, going into the 60s, the 1960s. So there's several of these. I mean, these are just some, right? But there's, this, there's many of these, these periods. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. I mean, in a way, that's, yeah, I, I was keen for, for that to be identified, that there's a cyclical nature to, to all of this. And, and some of it is repetitive. Some of it is, is evolving. But um, Donna, can I, if I could bring you in it, at this point, and just just to um, ask you, what are the things in Andrea's play, particularly, that really resonate with you? Well, in the book, I mean, she says she wrote the book. She wanted to write a story about a black woman and a white woman in Earl's Court, and then realised that um, she couldn't really without finding how they got there, and. <clears throat> The schism in the middle of the 20th century was the, the Second World War, she says. Mm. And Caribbean people were omitted from the storytelling around that war. So she found herself then writing about, starting the story about the war. And I think that, that this as a play, at any time in the last 70 years that this play could have been shown, it would have been the optimum time to show it. I think, I think, um, was it, was it um, what's his name? Uh, record, Barry Record, a yeah, yeah. uh, 1960s uh, Jamaican writer had some plays put on and he was astonished at how little Britain knew about their own empire mm. and he showed that. And in the 30s, Una Marson had a play on in London mm -hmm. as well. But generally, women have been excluded, as black women, well, exclude, excluded from everything, but uh, we've been excluded about, uh, from, from telling this story from our perspective. Because, we, you know, there's Sam Selvon and, and uh, mm -hmm. these guys who, who wrote about immigration in the, uh, in the early 50s and uh, throughout the 50s and into the, into the 60s, Brathwaite, for instance. But for, for, for this story to be told, I think Andrea Levy has written a piece of, it's such an epic, immense piece of British storytelling mm -hmm. that draws all the strands of empire. India is in there, Burma is in there, working class white people are in there upper class Jamaicans are in there because you never see them in a play. So Miss mm -hmm. Hortense is very, a bit rather like my mother, very upper class and very well spoken and, can, and she can quote reams of Shakespeare because that's how she was brought up. <laughs> and even that an examination of that colonialism where, as Derek Walcott said, you know, to write the word mango next to apple was a very defiant thing to do because a mango was a colonized fruit and it wasn't ever to be in, on the same line as apple, which was foreign and British and so much better because it wasn't colonized. So for her to bring all those strands together in this story, I think is remarkable. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I, would agree with, I would agree with that. I think one of the really interesting things for me, because I was re-watching the play this morning, is that thing of the way that it narrates um, the RAF, the contribution that Black soldiers made to the, to the war effort. And in some ways I'd forgotten that that was in the story, and it's so much because it has this before the war, what was their life like in the Caribbean, and then during the war, and then the sort of post-war period. And I think it's a really, really important contribution to make, again, relating to what I was saying earlier, that there were some people, especially younger ones coming up, that might not know about those uh, contributions. Oh, that's our and fault. And then, we're supposed to tell them. Sure. <laughs> and then the, the, women thing, the women thing as well, because I was thinking about um, another play, I think the National did that also, which was Errol John's Moon on a Rainbow Shore, that yeah. has a strong woman character, but is really very much about the, the male character's decision to leave. I suppose, and then the impact that, that would have on the women. Whereas this one, the centering of four tenths, and then four tenths is kind of friendship um, with uh, Queenie when she arrives in the UK, I think is really important. And as Donna just said, the kind of class 
different mm. class levels as well. So it's, it's a really, really interesting piece of writing. And play. Yeah, great. And Tyrone, I'd uh, t- like to turn to you at, at this moment because um, as well as being an actor and a writer, you've also, if you, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you have been a campaigner and, a, and an activist uh, within the black theatre movement in, in the UK. And I just wonder, it, it, do you see this play as playing a part um, within that, that movement? And, it, you know, and also, so within the within the, the black theatre world, but beyond the black theatre world as well. Well, I'd, I'd say if there were three or four other story, plays telling the this, this story from slightly different angles, then this would be an important part of that tapestry. On its own, it's a powerful, epic piece of theatre and in the production of the National Theatre it's given a staging that is kind of that captures the energy and touches on all the the elements uh, that uh, I think have already been raised but it kind of there's a there's an element of it where as a piece of theatre I find myself thinking now whose story is it? Is it Queenie's story? Is it Hortense's story? There's a kind of a tension there. And there's another story I, I kind of imagine that is, that is a purely Caribbean story. And so it's all, I would like to see it as part of that tapestry. But as a piece of, as a piece of writing and a piece of theatre and, you know, drawing out the performances that it brought forward from the actors, I think it's a, a, a significant piece of work. But... In terms of the whole, I suppose, ebb and flow of theatre works, uh, the theatre works charting the Caribbean journey, and and this captures what I'd call the sort of the age of innocence, a very transient moment where there was an innocence about the relationship from on, on both sides. Um, one carried a lot of prejudice, the, the, you know, the white English one carried prejudice also built into the fabric of it. And the Caribbean one ca- carried a sort of a misunderstanding or naivety or a, a, a lack of, well, a, an innocence about actually what were they, what was the journey, what was the connection between them and, and, and the mother country. In theatre terms, it's a kind of, you know, it could be a staging post, but in many ways, they've been staging posts before, and they kind of have sort of surfaced, been there, and then vanished. The difficulty is how to maintain the, the I don't know, the thread of energy of these type of stories. As Donna mentioned, it's, it's our job to tell these stories, really. Um, and if the young um, audiences are coming up now and seeing these sto- this, a story like this for the first time, then there is obviously a fault that's occurred that hasn't allowed them to see it until now. Before, yeah. yes. And, and, and some of the, I suppose some of the work that I've been involved with in terms of, you know, rejigging the structure of theatre has been about kind of diving down into what is it, what is the mechanism? And at the end of the day, I always come down to it is the work. Unless the work is on the stage, yeah. the, the sort of all the shenanigans about sort of, you know, placing the right people in other stuff, in other places and getting the right sort of balance of, of numbers and all those sort of things is this kind of immaterial, unless the work ends up on, this, on, the, on the stage. The other thing about this piece is that I, uh, you know, as I sort of watched it and uh, I kind of, you know, the last bit where you get a little scan of the audience and you think, well, there's something that's incredibly charming about this piece. And, and I think there's room for that charm, but there's also a room for a, a sort of something a little bit more brutal. When I, when, I, when I talk about that in terms of brutality, you know, you, there are brutal moments in this, in this piece where the language comes up. But there's a kind of, there are a few times where I think, hmm, haven't we had that monkey joke before? We've had it three times in this piece. Why is it there? When, then you look at the, 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 the British 
sort of story and you know inept husband ma male character you kind of you have seen those before they're, they're tropes i suppose is what i'm yeah. saying yeah. that are coming through and when i talk about something brutal what i mean is something that moves beyond the tropes what are the conversations the real conversations that were had by those black men in those rooms without being observed by mm -hmm. a, a, a white populace mm -hmm. those are the kind of stories i think are constantly constantly missed and so with something like this i kind of what I'm glorying in is the fact that it's given those actors, you know, I'm an actor, so I kind of champion <laughs> actors. It's given those actors, uh, those black actors, an opportunity to play something, challenge themselves about <laughs> working with, uh, with dialect learning, probably bits of history. But what I'd want to see is what, do, what happens when they play themselves in a British context, because I think it's very easy often in, um, in British theater to kind of look at the American story, look at the African story, and kind of look at the Caribbean story. You, you mentioned uh, that, that, uh, you mentioned Moon on a Rainbow Shore. The good thing about that is it's at a distance. What I'm kind of continually more interested in is what is the British story that sort of starts where, where um, um, Small well, Island yeah. ends. Yeah. And, you know, and I think there's, if you don't follow it up with those, then pointless, pointless. But, but I, I, I think, I think, I think those stories are told, but... Yeah, and then they're um, on stages at the National Theatre. Well, no, not at the National Theatre, no. But, you know, Roy Williams has a, a body of yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, Kwame's got a, a body of work. Um, they're not sort of in a canon. They're, they're not plays that are done in other theatres. I think Lynette Linton, now at the Bush, one of her wish lists is to get uh, plays on that were done in the 70s, 80s, and you know, Edgar White, uh, uh, Michael Abensett, those kind of, no female writers there, but you know. Uh, but, they're, but they're there. And the, the conversations in the betting shop with outside of the white gaze are in those plays. Yeah, yes, they are. Uh, and in a way, what happened is it feels like during the 60s and into the 70s, those plays found space on the stages. Yes, and they yeah. kind of, they haven't been added to the canon, I suppose. It, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about Small Island is the fact that it, it's looking back but it's, you know, the, the book was written, what, in the early 2000s? Yeah, 2004. Play, was it? Yeah, and then the play, another 15 or 16 years after that. And when I was watching it, I, could, I, I had a kind of sense that, you're right, Tyrone, they, they were stereotypes, but there also seemed to be something of a bit of a critique, slightly. I don't know whether that was in the way that they were, were playing it or... But it felt to me sometimes that the... The, the Hortense character's view, if we're watching it through her kind of point of view, that that was a kind of critique of what we were seeing being represented. But maybe I'm just reading it that way because I wanted to read it that way. But it, it felt like there was, kind of, there was what really happened and what, what we can say about what really happened from the 2004 moment or the 2009. I, I think who's telling the story is, is mm. very important in film and television. In a novel, I mean, in the, in the book, there are four stories. Bernard's mm. story is there as well, but we, you just haven't got time uh, on stage. I think that's the point. Just, in a way, it's such yes. an epic that you yes. can't yeah. like, get deep enough yeah. into it. And that's why I say, alongside other pieces of work that look yeah. at the same um, sort of time period. Mm. I mean, from, from my point of view, I would love to see Hortense as the driving yeah. character in that play because yeah, yeah. the story is written by Andrea Levy for no yeah. other reason than that. Yeah. And I yeah. can't think of another play that has uh, a black woman at the center as, as a driving force character. Yeah. Maybe some of Winston Pinnock's work, I suppose, isn't it? So, um, some, of again? Some, of Winston, some of Winston Pinnock's work, maybe? Um, yes, yeah, some of Winston. Like kind of women. Yeah. 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 No, go for Lynette, please. No, there was a point I remember when I saw the original production um, a couple of years ago, but I was like, oh, there's a really long period in the middle of the play where there aren't really, the black people are sort of almost absent. 
And I was at that point when I saw the original production, I was like, oh, where? I thought this was Andrea Levy's book. I remember the book. I've got fond memories of the book. I remember Hortense. Where, what, why have we got yes. this section where the black people aren't there? So, yeah. 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 And, 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 yeah. and on that point, which, I, which is really great, of which for me, I, re, I read that about being perspective in the sense of point of view, whose perspective are we telling it from? And I know Melissa, uh, well, my understanding of history that, you know, that is a key issue in terms of history. And Lynette obviously referred to this as a history <laughs> play. Yeah. But Melissa, I don't know in terms of your research and what your understanding of that, uh, who gets to tell the story and how it has that changed, even in, in the time that you've been doing research and, and this particular research into yeah, Africa and Caribbean. I mean, so this is a big problem in history, the absence of um, black women um, as, as central actors within that history, it, it, it very much absent. And um, a lot of that has to do with the way history is told, right? History in, in sort of the Western, um, uh, in Western knowledge is told based on archival documents and who creates archival documents, right? And so there's an absence of, of black women talking about their own lives, about their own stories, black Caribbean women, especially talking about their own lives and stories in those archives. And because of those absences, historians who, uh, Western historians who rely on those archives then don't tell those stories. And so um, I suppose in a way, that's why um, theater and, and, um, and fiction has been so important in terms of Caribbean history and Caribbean storytelling because it's actually it's often only through these different kinds of of means that we can give voice to 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 black women quite frankly right mm. marginalized especially marginalized uh, black women so poor black women um, and that's what's so wonderful about plays like this I think is that they you know there's a there's a story here even if she's not um, even if uh, um, Hortense is not always at the center of that, or it's not always from her perspective. At least she is present. She is speaking. It is you see, you know, this this story from her point of view, and you won't mm. often get that historically if it's only, if we're only basing it mm. basing it on the historical record. There's a massive mm. uh, absence. Yeah. Melissa, I thought I thought at one point you were going to come in, and I'm conscious we have a matter of minutes left. Uh, I, was, I was just, I think it was something that Donna said about like, uh, about um, the stories that we tell and the stories that get told. I mean, I think so much of the stories that certainly within history and I think a lot um, in, in theatre and in literature often, it depends on the audience, right? Like, it's, who are these stories being sold to? Who are, the, who are we speaking to and who's funding this? And so a lot of the stories, I think many of the historic um, uh, stories that we want to tell are not about, um, well, quite frankly, they're not white, about white people, right? They're not about white people. They're not about the, the racism that black people are necessarily facing. They're about black life, black people mm. living, right, as, hear, as people. I can hear Toni Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I think that's really important. I think those stories are very important to tell. And, and you know, um, and we need to do more of that. Quite frankly, we need to do more of that. Yeah, it feels to me like um, we're we're centering around the issue of perspective and who's. I love that question that you posed earlier, Tyrone, about whose story is it. And I'm, uh, but also I'm interested in not only whose story is it, but also uh, who needs to tell it and who needs who needs to hear it. Um, I don't know if you've got anything you could, you could say about that, Lynette. It's funny, one of the things I've said a lot in my career <laughs> is that we, we can't prove the untold stories, right? So there may have been play, as we left the discussion, I was kind of thinking about the question of who decides which black plays get produced, um, and at certain times who decides which get, black plays get produced, and therefore which stories get told. And I've said often, you know, you can't prove the untold stories because we don't know the plays that have been sent in that have maybe been told from whether it's black women's point of view, black LGBT points of view, but just aren't commissioned by particularly mainstream venues. So we, we don't get the kind of range of stories. And then 
with Small Island, maybe a slightly controversial point to be made, but the production team for this play was a white, wholly white production team. No, it was a, no really? I remember at the time, I think <laughs> someone tweeted like, well, where were the black writers then? When you, when, when you were deciding to commission this play, where were all the black playwrights that could have done this, made this adaptation of Andrew Levy's play, so black women playwrights? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they've, mm -hmm. they've been asked and said, no, we don't know. Can, do I, can know I say something on behalf of... Yes, please. Can I say something on behalf of black women playwrights? This is, this is what I'm hearing from my black women play writer friends. Uh, in the theatre in Britain, there is no system of support for writers. You send in a play and you've spent five years, you know, writing it and you've had no money for it. There's no system of support. And, but, but the theatres recognise that they need to do some black work. So this is happen, happening more and more often. The theatres will find a play that's been tried and tested in America and bring it over because that's going to make money because it's made money in New York. So for every time that happens, there are writers who are just slipping to the bottom and, will, and their voices will never be heard. But we'd, we'd rather point the finger and let's have a black American play because all the racism that happens obviously is in America. There's none here. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing as what I'm saying. We don't know, we don't know the plays that have been sent in that, that people yeah. haven't chosen. Um, put on and it's very difficult yeah. to to find out how we might get some of that information and there, well, there's another, but, yeah there's yeah. another element to that because there i always describe theater as a social profession i.e there is in a way no reason to take anyone into a rehearsal room that you don't really like to a certain extent <laughs> <coughs> but that works all the way down and it's kind of almost part of the, the the british culture we kind of try to set it up and work it as a meritocracy but it isn't it's a social interactionocracy i.e mm -hmm. if you're the type of person who they're, they're you know they're happy to have at their dinner party then you're more likely to actually have work done and I think it's kind of that's the bit behind the the door that I've seen as a board member on, on, in organizations that that's there's so much of stuff that happens before you even set up the uh, you know the the development hell that uh, yes. just black practitioners get sent into where you're cycled around and after you've been in it for about five years you're spun out and the next intake is taken and the, the fact you've been developed is completely forgotten. You'll know your yesterday's news and then tomorrow it's going to be someone else. And it's a kind mm -hmm. of, you know, it develops this cycle in itself and it's, it's hopeless. And, uh, and, and, and that's part of the mechanism that you're talking about, Nick, Lynette, that you kind of don't know what's going on. And then what you're talking about, Donna, in terms of the development and support processes, that mechanism of bringing in American work is, well, the other part of it is to look at the actors, the, the high profile actors that we have. They are only high profile because most of them went to America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, in, and, <laughs> and not accredited in America. Theatre doesn't accredit us. Television here does. Mm. But in terms of uh, bringing uh, the, you know, the journey of work, it's, it, it's a, it, there's a kind of, let's look elsewhere for accreditation, mm. but let's not sort of discover it here. It's a peculiar one. So I mean, I'd like to bring Melissa in, in a second, um, but just to sort of tie some of those threads together, because I mean, we started at a point with me asking, um, showing streaming Small Island, right now the middle of june 2020 is it timely and it just and it feels to me that in the in the course of this conversation or where we're at at the moment um it's it absolutely illuminates how timely it is all it feels like the play is a metaphor um for for where but not only british theater is but where where society you know where we have a play where there is a, a host country inviting a group of people 
in to come and work for them but there's also an under or subtext of we only want a certain type of person or you know who's going to uh, fit in in the way that we want them to fit in um and we you know what i mean and and there's there's the involvement of america within that and and the and the role they, they have to play within it i feel um you know it yeah there's that you know as i said it's a much bigger discussion um yeah. and melissa as you say is such a complex and intertwined relationship but i i turn to you at this point melissa and maybe you too lynette in terms of you know um we often think of history uh having lessons to, to teach us uh, do you, in this context are there are there things that we can learn from uh this experience <laughs> <laughs> but, but this this question has just generated. <laughs> this is going on YouTube. It'll be there forever. <laughs> it's a good question because there is the question of race relations, which obviously is a good thing where you, where you want to think about this place, the place kind of topical topicality now, and to kind of see instances in the play where there was you know, some police brutality. It's only a minor part of the play but it was kind of there and to, to, to see uh, people um, people being explicitly racist towards um, some of the characters in the plays on their arrival and to kind of think okay well that was then so we might appreciate that from the war and then the post-war period and then previous to that when, it, when the play was in Jamaica set in Jamaica the parts of it but to think that some of those things are still so resonant now I mean, the again, when I was watching it, I was thinking about the, the the piece that was on the BBC a couple of weeks ago, Sitting in Limbo, so the thing about kind of Windrush and the way that the Windrush um, generation that came to England as children, how that generation has been treated it over the past years in, in Britain as the Windrush scandal. So there's a lot of kind of topical issues that were topical then that remain topical for us. Um, now i suppose so i think the issue around race and how how we communicate between within and between races is a really important one and queenie and hortense kind of seem to solve that in the limited way that they could within that context and um, so there might be some kind of lessons from their kind of relationship to take away yeah i'm just been a bit hopeful there but <laughs> <laughs> you know, because when, no, because when, because when, because when, um, you know, initially there's a kind of hostility, a suspicion, yeah. are they going to like each other and they, they're not going to like each other and then in the end they, they kind of, they do unite a bit and they, they help each other and I think there's, there's something to be taken away from, from that. Yeah. I think you're way more positive than I am. <laughs> I'm a bit nostalgic, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> that bit, okay, Melissa, well, let, let, let's keep it real. <laughs> so I, I suppose, I, I, I think that we're going to continue to have these kinds of, yeah. I don't think anything is going to change until we, we really come to grips with what mm -hmm. race is and how racism actually operates. And I mean, the relationship between Hortense and Queenie is actually quite, it's quite lovely, it's quite idealistic in, 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 in lots of ways, right? And, and you know, as I sometimes say to my students, slave owners had intimate relationships with Black people. They had best friends who were Black, right? Like people they would have considered like their closest friends they grew up with, right? And they were slave owners. And so I don't think that intimacy is necessarily going to solve um, the problem with race relations. I think we need to understand how racism works. We need to understand the power involved in it. I think we need to come to, come to terms with ideas around like white supremacy and how these things are embedded within the structures and institutions of our society. And I think until we do that, it's we're we're just you know like it's just we're putting a band aid over a problem that's you know three four hundred years in the making. And so um, these stories are all really nice. I think like they're really. Um, but I think we're going to continue to have these kind of, you know, the kinds of, well, well the, it's, not even, it's not even like every few years, it's just continual problems, like problems around police brutality. These aren't, <laughs> like these yeah, are hundreds yeah. of years old. These are just things that are just going to continue, I think. 
Um, what's, what's kind of hopeful now is the, the discussion around anti-racism. The idea that, you know, that, you know, that you see in the, the Black Lives Matter movement that we need to be actively anti-racist. It's not just a matter of, you know, liking people that we have to actually combat the way that we're thinking, the negative way, the ways that we think about race and difference. Um, and I think that's quite hopeful. And I'm, you know, and I'm hoping that that is what's going to help us in changing, um, you know, in the years to come. I suppose my thing is that plays help us to tap into that stuff. And I guess I have to be invested Absolutely. in that, right? Because that's part of what I do. I look yeah. at plays and I look at representation and I think about the ways in which representation allows us to, to question um, mm -hmm. the world. So mm -hmm. maybe that's where the kind of nostalgic part comes from. It's like the play shows something mm -hmm. that then allows us to have a debate about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's really, it's, it's important, I think. I think representation, I think you're, you're, that representation is absolutely important. It's also about showing, I mean, you see a lot of this in black um, film and TV, right? Like the, 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 the range of representations of black people on TV and on stage, I think it's fantastic. And it opens up, um, uh, it challenges some of these older stereotypes and the tropes mm. of who black people are and, and how, you know, and, and even for our, ourselves in our own communities, I think it's really important. I just wanted to, yeah. to, to comment on um, the point that uh, Melissa was making um, about the construction of whiteness and the construction of blackness. And I, I think those, those theories are very well established by black academics and white academics, but they're not known. Then especially white people don't recognize when you say something like construction of whiteness, they, they don't oh, understand oh no. it as, as a concept. No. And I, for one, am tired of explaining it. So I've got to the stage where I just think racism is not my problem. I'm not the one who's being dehumanized by it. You are dehumanizing yourself by it. And that was quite clear in the production of, of this play as well, that a lot of the white characters, uh, especially the Americans, came out uh, very, very animalistic, if that's the right I can put it that way because yeah. they just didn't couldn't find any humanity and Bernard the slightly autistic withdrawn f at the end couldn't see the problems with having a black child and was willing to take on uh, Queenie's Queenie and Michael's child so there was a that was a nice thing for him to get to and I thought I thought it was a great way of of um, What's the word I'm looking focusing on that particular problem mm. that, that Andrea had found? Yeah. Can I, can I, can I, it's a question to you all really, uh, which is about the overt racism in the play um, and how, you know, what was your immediate response to that, see, you know, to that racism um, being uh, presented in that way? For me, I think it was, I thought the racist, that racism almost was a byproduct of the fact that uh, there was a white audience in a way for the, for the piece. That if, that they, it was for them, it kind of felt for their benefit. I didn't particularly need it. I yeah. kind of know it, but yeah. to sort of have it demonstrated felt like it wasn't, it, yeah, it's real, it's real, it, it captured a reality. But for some, I mean, at some level, it felt like it was more for uh, a white audience. It felt like it was an element that was necessary or useful, or important for a white element, for yeah. a white audience. Yeah, and, and do you think that taps into some of what Donna is talking about, about the, uh, ra the con racism as a construct, which actually she doesn't want to have to keep telling people anymore? Yes, because it means that, you know, it's laid out for the white audience and they get to almost laugh at the absurdity of it, but not really engage with it as a facet of their everyday life. And I think that's one of the things in the play that was a, 
the tricky a tricky thing for me, but it's one of those ones as well. I know that when you're in a production and you're doing all the research and you're trying being true to the work, that it's uh, it, it it is an important. You you almost have to psychologically go over the hump of of uh, recoiling from it and absorb it as 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 part of the truth you're trying to trying to portray and so in terms of the play it sort of it was a truth but i didn't feel i kind of needed it a question on on that racism on that overt racism as well as and going back to our theme in terms of the historical perspective is is the and really it's a question for you melissa and lynette as yeah historians or whatever but is there a, is there a danger uh of the racism almost being sugar-coated because we think of this as history as 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 the past um and that that was then and that was those uneducated uninformed people then and their ideas and behavior but that doesn't uh you know apply to now or or have an impact and resonance for now Is that I, mean, within, <laughs> like, I mean, I feel like within the our current context, I feel like there could be no mistake. Surely, with the, you know, with the things that are happening right now, the protests, and you know, I mean, I feel like that that there can be no mistake that this is a continuing. There's a continuation here. Um, I don't know, Lynette. I don't know if you have a different take on this, but I feel like that's, yeah. there's no question about it. That is connected, is what you're saying. That that it's that is it, there is continuation of the institutional and sort of everyday racism. Mm. I, I you know yeah. I feel like that's. But I suppose that, there is a danger that people watching might kind of say it's just what you just said. I'm going to repeat it really. But they say, <laughs> well, in 1948, when Hortense and um, Michael and whose partner whose name I've even forgotten right now came to England people were racist and people were explicitly racist and that was those people so it goes back to what I said at the beginning I say if it's a historical play people think oh well that was like that then not black people but let's say white some white people might be like oh yes that was what it was like then and we're just not like that now you know so there's a kind of uh I don't know that people become comfortable with the idea that things yeah. have changed since those mm -hmm. times. We're nowhere near like that now, without really recognising that it's still the same. Which is really, yeah. really, 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 in, in many the, ways, you know, the institutional yeah. racism I think is really important there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so at the time she was told she, you need to retrain, and mm -hmm. now black people aren't in the in leadership positions in theatres, mm -hmm. etc., 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 um, in education. So the, the issues are still there, even if they're slightly different. But mm -hmm. I don't, I don't believe that the white audience would necessarily understand that because I think many would maybe take it the way that I framed it, which is as a historical play that was looking at a particular moment in time and yeah. and would miss some of the resonances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't miss I it because we live it, you know. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose it. I suppose this is a common. Thing where we don't we don't like to we can't see ourselves in in the past so we don't see we never you never think of yourself as possible like that you would possibly be the baddie in the past right like you wouldn't be the slave owner in the past you'd be the abolitionist of course i'd be the abolitionist right exactly. like i think that's yeah. a very <laughs> <laughs> we'd all be <laughs> grab pits wouldn't we yeah, of course. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, who else? i wouldn't be that person right and yeah. um i mean that's our own i mean that is a part of sort of what donna was saying about our lack people our our inability I'm saying, I'm saying our inability, but particular communities' inability to be self-reflective. Mm. Okay, particularly whiteness, right? Because it's so yeah. normal, yeah. right? Quite frankly, and so it's that inability to see yourself as part of the problem, or seeing your actions, seeing what you do as perpetuating racism. Mm. Mm. And, the and, 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 and the danger yeah. that you think that oh, it, that's all gone away now. It's, Absolutely. It's been fixed, that, that's not you know. that's not a problem. That's not a problem. And I mean, even people, to be honest, even people in 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 um, certainly in my family, I know many, um, you know, in black some black families who also perpetuate this idea. And it, a lot of it has to do with class as well. So if you don't experience it on a day to day, hmm. you might not. You might think that it's it's not an issue or it's not as bad or whatever else. And it's you know. Um, mm. 
And I'd be keen on um, the other element, I think, of the play that sort of uh, struck me. It's not as gross as uh, in, in some uh, stories, but that I, that thing of the focus on black pain, it's almost like there's a prurience about it that I find sort of slightly disturbing. Okay, it kind of creates tension and drama and all that sort of stuff, but it's like, you know, where is the, the, the sort of the intellectual battle put on stage between, um, um, you know, between black people or in, in engagement with uh, white, that, you know, the, the portrayal, the continual and repetitive portrayal of the black narrative as being about pain is mm -hmm. one thing that I think the cycle has to break at some point because it is tedious. It this is, is so, I absolutely agree, Tyrone. This is so tiring. It is so tiring always mm -hmm. that, you know, to see brutalized black bodies, but, you know, that as, as um, for me, that's just, that's still centering whiteness. Yeah, yeah. Quite absolutely. frankly, right? Like that's not about uh, black communities. That is about, you know, this fascination with, with the brutalization of black bodies that is again quite historic and it but is incredibly it, tiring. It becomes part of the fabric of life. There was um, a short film festival I went to see at BAFTA and these are all black filmmakers, this is for black filmmakers mm -hmm. and I sat and I watched six films at the, in the final and at the end of it I turned to Ellen Thomas, my best friend, and said do you realize there are no black women in any of these films except two and they were both crying mm. Mm. and these were films made by young black people and that's mm. just that 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 black pain is now cinematic metaphor it, it's it you sells know. though, doesn't it? <laughs> like that is funny. not to me. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it sells to, to the you know when we this conversation about like who produces this work and where the money is coming from, right? Like it sells to it, um, to a white audience, quite frankly. Yeah, <laughs> I don't does. think that's what it does. But what I find, in a way, uh, if you like, I'm going to step into the optimistic, onto the opt optimistic <laughs> pedestal for a moment, and say that I kind of. Uh, part of, if you like, what I feel the climate is about now and probably has been subterranean for a while is that actually the audiences are ready for the other. Mm -hmm. I just think it's the theatres and the promoters and the financiers that are not. Yep. Kind of, they're still working off a, 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 the texture of, a, of a, an old model of how mm -hmm. you deal with these narratives uh, but the audience and I think you know just looking at the the Black Lives Matter protests you kind of get the sense that they are ready for it but if you lose the opportunity of putting it in front of them now they yes. will just be reverted back to the yeah. old model yeah, 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 and yeah. I think you know that's that's the that's that's where my optimism is that actually if we can and you know, if we, if some of those younger uh, entrepreneurs and thinkers are are know enough not to be duped, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the process will try to dupe them, that they know, know and are supported and connected uh, uh, broad and 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 wide, uh, that maybe this energy could be harnessed to take just the next step forward mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean i think there's well, examples yes. of that on television though i, I keep thinking about yes. um, Issa ray i'm not certain if any of you've seen insecure for instance for example which is uh so Issa ray fantastic um it, it's a it, it's a tv show about uh four young black women in california and just their lives it's just about their yeah. lives right it's not about racism it's not about you know it's just about these women living and it's quite beautiful, but there's other films that I think and and um, TV shows that are examples of this that are just about these black people <laughs> and living living lives, about, yeah, right, yeah. Just living, as we do, <laughs> yeah, as yeah. we do. And um, so I think you're, I think you're right, Tyrone. That there's definitely like we're definitely ready for it. I think we want it, right? Yeah, that's, a, you know. that's great. I mean, that's a really optimistic message coming out of this. 
conversation which yeah. I'm, I'm delighted about. I mean, in, and 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 in terms of being ready for it, I mean, it, is it uh, you know is it fair to say that we celebrate something like Small Island uh, at the National Theatre, uh, the UK's largest stage, etc. But is it also a moment to say that? But let's put a full stop on that, almost because we're moving into as as the story itself is about uh, rebirth and moving into a new era and a, and a new landscape. A new uh, is that the moment we're at now? And should we try and use the energy of something like Small Island to catapult us into that into that arena? That's, yes, I think we. I think we should. It feels like. Um, in the 60s when um, Tamla Motown arrived. Because before Tamla Motown, we were always told that black people couldn't really make mu money in the music industry because yeah. white people wouldn't buy the music. Now, if you go to a Diana Ross concert, there ain't no black people there. So <laughs> that, 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 that one's blown out of the water. The next one was... Um, I don't know if that's a vision we want. <laughs> but you know it's true do black yeah. people read books well you know the all, all the um nobel literature you, you know Derek walcott and tony morris and yeah, yeah. So that one's been blown out of the water and then there's visual arts you know, you've got chris of feely you've got zach obey you've got faith ringgold who's been going for years mm -hmm. so that argument's blown out of the water the last bastion is storytelling and I mm -hmm. think it's because it is the most important art form. It's the first art form. Before we painted things on caves, we sat around a fire telling stories. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the most powerful art form. And that, and that is why I think it's been so hard to break down. It, it, yeah. it changes the way people see the world, the way people see themselves in the world. And... Um, that's, that's why it's been so hard to break. But, and I think a lot of it is also down to the fact that a lot of young white people grew up for eight years with President Obama and hey ho, the world is still on its axis. So mm -hmm. well, there's no fear there. Mm -hmm. They can see themselves in relation to, to our stories and that's a new world they want to be part mm -hmm. of. We are gonna have to bring this, uh conversation to an end in a, in a moment and it's been fascinating and brilliant. brilliant. I, I'd like to I'd like just sort of, uh, if you can, you know, go around uh, uh, one at a time and just pick up on that idea of, of, of making space for something else and what you were talking about, Donna, about it being, you know, the most important art form, the, you know, the stories we tell ourselves. Um, how, what do we do? Where, you know, where are we at? If this is the beginning of a new epoch, what is really, really important that, that we do or that, um, that what, what, we, what we want to see happen? Well, I'd like to see, I'd like, what I'd like to see is more leadership uh, and people coming up with new ideas um, and not relying on the, the old, oh, the box office won't take it argument, but finding, as Tyrone says, a space where we can have the great, the well-made play and a great piece of theatre all together. And I think we'll get there. Yeah, and when you say uh, the leadership, where, are, you, are you looking for somewhere where that leadership is going to come from? Or are you look, thinking in terms of a particular type of leadership? I'm thinking in terms of um, the artistic directors, the theatre pr practitioners, the academics, black academics, coming to a place and saying, this is what we need to do and, and, um, and push for that throughout the theatres in the country. But it's right. great that the National's leading it. <laughs> so <laughs> as it should. <laughs> of course, we, you know, what else could it do? <laughs> Who's next? I would just uh, ditto uh, Donna. Right, because we've got seconds, yeah. well done. Me too, oh, and we'll okay. say that the kind of dialogue and debate are the contemporary moment. So mm. that, that the kind of plays that, that, rep, that are representing a debate in the kinds of issues that we've spoken about here, and in terms of Black Lives Matter in particular, and uh, things that actually show that in our main stages. Yeah, fantastic. Really good. 
Yeah. Melissa? I would just uh, third or fourth. <laughs> Donna, Donna, you are the leader. Okay, I'm the leader. You always have been. <laughs> so here, here we go from now. <laughs> Lord, oh yeah, dear, but here's, <laughs> well, thank you all so much uh, for giving um, so much food for thought on, on uh, lots of subjects, really jumping off from Small Island, what it gave to us in terms of then and reflection on then as to where we are now and hopefully how we might be in terms of how we can populate those main stages and tell those, I hope our new narratives, I join you all in that ditto of going that there are many, many more stories, many more, many, many, many more experiences that we need to share uh, with each other. So thank you all very much. Indeed. Thank you, Ola. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. Really thank nice. You. Lovely to meet everyone.